Today's awesome guest is Samantha Burke. Samantha is an award-winning design leader with nearly 15 years of experience in visioning, creating, and shipping next-generation consumer products. She leads and motivates teams with proven success across a variety of environments, including large-scale tech companies, mid-sized design consulting firms, and venture-backed startups. She's passionate about building tight-knit, high-performing teams and creating cultures of inclusion and equity. She's created and led women's groups at multiple organizations and regularly speaks at events in the design and fintech communities around how to design your career and how to create inclusive products that empower. Welcome to the show, Sam. Super excited to have you. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. I was just thinking about, as I was reading your bio, I sounded like one of those like insurance like ad people, like really quickly <laughs> zipping through it. And I'm like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> uh, it happens to the best of us. <laughs> oh my God. You know, it's so awesome that I'm talking to you. You're the head of design at Chime. And, and I'm just thinking about from my perspective, like you're on this other side and I'm on this other side. And it seems like, it seems like a super awesome job. It's like, it seems like you've made it. And, um, <laughs> and everyone wants to be like a head of design. Like these days when I talk to other designers, everyone's trying to work hard to get to that head of design uh, level. Um, so is it that easy? Is it that easy being the head of design? Oh gosh. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. It's, it's this like very weird, I think, moment for me in, in my career um, because it's something I've always wanted to do. And now I'm here and I find that I'm still not satisfied, maybe is the word. Um, and I have to sometimes like remind myself like, hey, <laughs> this is the thing you've always wanted to do. Let's maybe stop and like enjoy it for a minute um, and really appreciate, you know, where you are, where you've come from. Um, I started my career about 12 years ago. And so it's been a tremendous amount of hustle over the last 12 years to get here. Um, and, you know, sadly, depending on how you look at it or happily, there's still a lot of career left. There's still a lot of working, working years left in my lifetime. Um, so still a lot to do. Um, is it easy? I mean, no, but is, is anything ever easy? If plus, if it was easy, what fun would it be? 12 years of nonstop hustle and grind. Like it just blew my mind away. So <laughs> Like, it, it's insane. Like, 12 years ago, when you're just like all of us, like you're starting out as a designer, and now you're, at the, you know, like the head of design. In between that journey, when did you feel that, oh, you know what, like leadership is something is I'm interested in or is something that could be for me, like a path instead of just being an individual contributor? Yeah, great question. Um, I, I think, honestly, maybe in my first job, um, and I've, I found this to be true of pretty much every job I've had, but having a good manager is like having a good professor or a good teacher when you're in school, you could be learning the most interesting topic, you know, learning about the most interesting topic in the world. And if you have somebody who just like stands there and drones on and lectures at you, that thing that you thought was super interesting, all of a sudden is just not interesting anymore. And it puts you to sleep, you know, and, and maybe in the opposite way, you could take something that on the surface seems really boring, but if someone talks to you and they're really energized and excited about it, and, you know, you can tell it's getting them really jazzed up. It kind of gets you jazzed up too. Um, I've found that managers in a job are really like that. When you have someone who is excited and goes above and beyond and shows you different ways to do things and, you know, helps you think through problems and use different frameworks, like it changes the job for you. It makes you really excited about what you're working on. It makes you want to show up every day and you're learning and growing and become a, becoming a better version of yourself. Um, and when you don't have that, a job kind of sucks, right? Like it's boring. You don't feel like you're growing. You're not really excited to go to work every day. Maybe you feel undermined or disempowered depending on who the person is. And it's just, it's really miserable. And so I think I was pretty early in my career where I noticed that it really mattered who I was working with and who I was working for. And I've always been very ambitious with my career. Um, and I started thinking about, you know, okay, so much of my career development depends on my manager. Like, certainly, I fully believe in owning your own career and owning your own development, right? So there's a lot that I was taking responsibility for and owning, but 
even the person who's owning their career the most at the end of the day, you know, a promotion, a raise, a title change, those things really come from your manager. And if your manager isn't excited about that stuff, isn't bought into it, doesn't want to help you with that, you're not going to get that career growth. Um, and so I decided really early on that this was important to me and therefore it's important to find and work for good managers. And it's important to be a good manager. And it was something that I thought, hey, I'm passionate about this. I want there to be more good managers in the world. I think this is something that I can do and do really well. Um, so I knew from very early on that I wanted to start managing. And I, I started leaning into that, whether that was thinking about like, oh, hey, we have an internship program. You know, Can I manage our intern or can I help mentor them? Um, looking for a lot of official and unofficial mentorship opportunities, whether that was in organizations around me, you know, or or at work or in other places. I spent a lot of time as a kid kind of teaching and coaching and mentoring. I taught Hebrew school for a number of years. I did a lot of babysitting. So kind of like nurturing and teaching others, I think, has come naturally to me. Um, and so I just kept looking for those opportunities until I could really, you know, take that on in a more official capacity. So you basically tried it in an official capacity, got a feel for it, then went in the official capacity. You also mentioned that, you know, you were noticing that who your manager was, was also impacting how you felt in the job. So I'm kind of curious, like, what are some of the things you took away that, that if I ever become the manager, I would not do this? Like, we all have had some <laughs> managers where some things were some quirks, some were just like outright, like, I'm never going to do this. Uh, so what are some of that list, that laundry list of things that if you ever became the manager, you'll make sure that you do not do any of this? <laughs> I don't know if I have a list of things I really don't want to do. I think I've actually been very lucky where I've had some not great managers in my lifetime I don't know if there have been any that have like destroyed, you know, my my career or my sanity or anything like that. But but I, I think there are definitely things I've seen where I've been like, I want to do that, or I've seen that have made me say, okay, here's how I might approach it differently. So one of the things I think a lot about is how to empower people. At the end of the day, like I'm I'm not the smartest person in the room. I also don't want to be the smartest person in the room. It's a lot of responsibility and it's quite honestly not that fun. I get a lot of joy out of working with really smart people and like collaborating and kind of plussing each other and adding on to things, you know, and, and innovating together. I don't get a lot of joy out of being the person in the room who I think has all the answers and telling everybody else what to do. It's just, it's not enjoyable. Um, so you know, a lot of what I think about is how do you create the right environment for other people to feel creative, to feel like they're doing their best work, to get really excited. And sometimes the environment that someone needs to do their best work is not the same as what I need to do my best work. Oh, um, wow. I think a lot about how do I hire people who I think are better at something than I am? And then how do I get out of their way? and let them do that thing. Um, I'm not good at everything. In fact, I'm not good at most things. Um, and I think a sign of a really good leader is somebody who's able to figure out what they're not good at and then hire great folks around them to do that. So for me personally, like I really love um, like culture creating. I really like building teams and kind of being that person who says, okay, let's do happy hour on this day and let's do Halloween and here's what we're going to dress up as. And that's where I like to spend a lot of my energy. I don't like to spend a lot of my energy on like, what tools should we use? <laughs> You know, like planning comes around. I'm like, I don't care if we're using Asana or Trello. And in fact, I don't want to use any of that. I'm like, I want you all to do your planning. I want you to come back to me, tell me what you planned and good, you're good to go, you know? And so, so finding people who are really great and have complementary skills to mine and who are better at those things than I am. Like, I'm not threatened by that. I want really great people. Um, and then when they're here, I want to get out of their way. I want to let them do that thing that I hired them to do because they're better at it than I am, you know? And so I don't want to tell them how to do that thing. I want to give them the space to do it. And I want to help them think critically about what they're doing and how they might do it better. But I don't want to tell them what to do, you know, or, or how to do it. I, I want them to go and run and come yeah. back and hopefully really surprise me, you know, come back with something I've never thought of before. That's going to be way better than what I would have come up with. Um, so that's, that's a big one. So as head of design, how much time do you actually spend in actual Figma designing versus like hiring, so to speak? Oh, zero. <laughs> there's, what? There's no time spent in Figma designing. <laughs> well, how that much time do you amazing. spend on hiring then? Oh, like 100%. <laughs> like what? probably 100% of my time. Um, it's, I mean, so look, maybe this isn't, 
true at, at all places. Um, but, but Chime, the company that I work at, is uh, very lucky to be in this hyper growth stage. Um, I've been there for two and a half years. And in the time I've been there, we've gone from, I don't know, I'd say 120, 130 people to about 1,100 people. Um, so really, oh really tremendous growth. And the only way you do that is by hiring. And you have to hire great people. Hiring takes a lot out of you and a lot of time and energy and onboarding and training people takes a lot of time and energy, but then they're going to be amazing and they're going to do great things. And there's nothing worse than hiring to put butts in seats, you know, and having someone work for you for a few months who you have to then manage out and rehire for because you didn't make a good decision the first time. So, so, so much, I would say almost all of my day, every day is dedicated to hiring and not necessarily the literal interviews, although there's a lot of that too. Um, but so much of it, I mean, this is the design work I do now, right? It's it's the org design. It's it's looking yeah. at the team and saying, okay, what skills are we hitting it out of the park on? What skills are we missing? What skills do we need to get better? And then how do we want to get better at those things? Or how do we want to fill those gaps that we're missing? Do we want to train people? Do we need to hire new people? Do we need to bring in new types of things? So one of the big things we added to our design team last, last year was content design. Um, which I'm sure for a lot of people listening to this are like, yeah, done. No kidding. But you know, at a startup, you start with a smaller team, you make do with what you've got and you, you add when you can. Um, and we were at a point where really, you know, the, the designers are spending a lot of time on content. They were spending a lot of time litigating content with our compliance folks, with our product folks, with, you know, content is one of those things kind of like design work that everybody has an opinion on because it's a language that everybody understands. And so there's a lot of debate there and a lot of the other types of design, you know, the interaction design, the visual design, the motion design weren't getting done, but also our designers who are really great at interaction and visual motion aren't necessarily great at content. They're not the same skill set. And so that was a big thing that, you know, I kind of looked at at the beginning of the year and said, okay, this is a thing now that we're spending too much time and we're not efficient at, we really need people who, whose expertise this is, who can come in and and really do this for us. Um, so that was kind of a, a piece of org design, you know, so the just to identify that like identifying the problem is number one, figuring out, okay, we can fix this by adding new people of the content design flavor was number two. Then number three is they're like, okay, now let's go do the recruiting and the interviews. You know, you, you end up hiring a couple people, getting them to accept the offer. Great. And then there's the onboarding and getting them up to speed. Um, and so that's really, you know, kind of what I do. It's, it's a lot of rinse and repeat and thinking about, you know, what does the company need from us as a team right now? How is that different than what the company needed from us six months ago? Who are the right people yeah. then that we need on the team now? What are the right places to find the kinds of people that we need? And what do we want this team to look like? You know, I think we've had, I think one of the silver linings of COVID is that it's forced us to re-examine our workspaces um, and how we want to build our teams. And so previous to COVID, you know, we had a pretty heavy, like we hire in the Bay Area policy. And if you yeah. want to come work here, you're going to relocate to the Bay Area. That's kind of gone out the window. And I'm, I feel very strongly that if we want to make experiences that are great for our members, then the people making the experiences, designing the experiences have to resemble our members. They have to have similar backgrounds. They have to have similar education levels. They have to have a similar understanding of the ways that the world kind of does or does not work. And for Chime, most of our members uh, spend more every month than they make. And that might be true in the Bay Area. I know it probably feels that way for all of us in the Bay Area. But realistically, a lot of us in the Bay Area are not dealing with the same problems day to day that our members are. Um, So COVID has been really great in that I'm hiring folks from all over the country. I would rather, in fact, hire folks not in the Bay Area than folks who are here. I'd rather hire folks who have never worked in fintech before, who have never worked in finance, who don't feel financially literate because those are our members. You know, and... And that's something now that we can do. And I'm glad you guys are doing it because like a designer like me, whatever the reason might be, I'm just very happy staying put in Dallas. And, you know, when, when there, I'm sure there are people like me who are like, they're like, we don't want to move out of this home city. So remote will be awesome, but we don't want to move to the Bay Area, maybe because the expensive um, nature of the city or whatever the reason might be. So that's really awesome. And something I was thinking about is it's like, Every shot that a sports person, an athlete takes, they are not, they're not always going to make it. 
So I'm kind of wondering, does that analogy apply to you in your career as a, you know, as a manager, as a design leader, that every hire you make is always going to turn out right? Maybe they don't turn out. Would, would that be true? No, I mean, there's no way. No one has a hundred percent record on hiring, you know. But but you try, and you learn each time, you know. I I think sometimes this idea of like failing fast gets a bad. I don't know. There's this idea that like it's great to fail. Everyone should fail. Like, don't fail stupidly, you know. But like, if you make a mistake and you learn from it, you do it better the next time. I've made bad hires. Was it hard for you to like fire them afterwards? Yeah. And it, you know, that that's tough for everybody, right? Like that's, that's tough for them. It's tough for you. And usually there's something that isn't gelling, right? You know, either it's a different job description than maybe what the person thought they were signing up for, or the company culture is different, or the person's skill set is different than how it presented, you know, in an interview and they just aren't making it. Um, and those are tough conversations to have, but I honestly think almost every time it works out best for both parties at the end, right? If someone is struggling to keep up, they're not having a good time at work. Don't get me wrong, like work isn't always a party, but you should enjoy what you do every day, you know, and, and want to be learning and growing. And you shouldn't be, you know, like trying to doggy paddle in the deep end just to keep your head above water. Um, you know, so I, I, I do think there are always mistakes made. And I've also made mistakes in choosing jobs that maybe weren't great, right? Like it's it's not always about someone having made a bad hire, you know, sometimes you think a company is one thing until you get in there and, and it's something totally different. But, you know, I, I think as we, as we learn to hire more broadly, I think it's also about us and looking at our own teams and our own companies and saying what needs to be different. And so this is the other piece of the org design that I do. And this is why it's interesting now hiring all over the country is I have to change the way that my team works. Like if we want to be equitable and inclusive of, of all types of people, we have to work differently than we have to date. So one example, and it's a very small one, is that within the design team, we kind of made a rule of like there are no meetings before 10 a.m. Pacific and there are no meetings after 2 p.m. Pacific because 2 p.m. Pacific is five o'clock on the East Coast and 10 a.m. Pacific is 7 a.m. in Hawaii. And so that covers all of our time zones in the U.S. to have like somewhat reasonable working hours. You know, and so if you're in Hawaii, you're going to have meetings from seven until 11, but then hopefully you have the afternoon to be heads down and do your work. If you're in New York, you kind of get the more, more broadly the East Coast. Sorry, I'm a New Yorker, so I'm very New York centric over there, yeah. but more, more inclusively, if you're on the East Coast, um, you know, you might not have meetings before uh, 10, one o'clock PM, you know, and then they end by five. So you kind of get the heads down time in the morning. If you're on the West Coast, you know, it's kind of in the middle, same for, for Central and, and Mountain Time. But, you know, that, that was a change we had to make. We were used to being able to go all day with our meetings. And, and that's just not going to be the right thing now that we're in different places. And so, I mean, these are the problems I, I'm constantly yeah. tackling as head of, head of design is really how do you run a team that is equitable, that is inclusive, that is a great place that people want to work at when that means a million different things to a million different people. And that doesn't mean I want to go hire all the same people to make that easier. It means like yeah. it's going to be a tough job because I want to have a different, a bunch of different types of people on the team. But what if you want to hire a candidate that you met at a design event and you're like, okay, I think we should hire this person. And you bring in the team to also interview them. But the team is like, no, but then you are kind of like, you know, it's still like a little bit keen on the candidate. What happens then? <laughs> um, I tell the team they're SOL and I bring the person in. No, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> right? Like this, this goes back to the idea of hiring different types of people and hiring people who are better than I am. Um, hiring is not done in a silo, nor should it be. And so if there's someone that I'm really jazzed about, I still want the rest of not the whole team always, you know, but I still want my leadership team to meet them. I want other folks on the team to meet them. And I want to genuinely hear their perspective. Like maybe they see something that I didn't see or vice versa. Um, I think we're all naturally drawn to people who are similar to us in some way, whether that's, you know, we both grew up in New York or we both had dogs or I don't know, our favorite color is blue, you know, whatever it is, like we like people who are like us. And sometimes that's good. And sometimes that puts you in an echo chamber, you know? And so certainly I don't want to be just bringing people onto the team because I like them. Um, I want to bring people into the team because they fill 
a gap that we have, or they offer a new perspective that we don't have yet. And so we try to be very objective about those things. And that's why I'm constantly evaluating, okay, where, where are we really hitting the mark and where are we missing the mark? Um, and when we're missing the mark, the answer is not always to go outside and hire new people. I think, I think companies can be very quick to say, hey, we need to go hire someone. We need to go hire someone. One of the things I'm working really hard to do on my team I want to develop the people that we have, you know, so when we need a new manager, I don't necessarily want to go outside and hire someone. I want to look at the folks who are leading my team and say, which of them is ready for a bigger role, you know, and, and I think that's really important. I think it it's so incredibly important to company culture and to the signal you give other folks. Like for someone like me, who's very ambitious in their career, I would way rather go work at a company where I see that they promote internally and people can stay there for, you know, five, six, seven years and get company growth than go work somewhere where I see people leaving after a year or two. And I feel like, okay, I might learn something, but pretty soon I'm going to have to go somewhere else to keep learning. So right there, let's say you have a star candidate on your team and you know, Chime's an awesome hyper growth startup, but let's say Facebook, Apple, Google, Netflix, the fang, one of them comes in and, you know, gives just outrageous amount of money. And let's say in this specific situation, you cannot cross or you cannot maybe, you know, maybe meet exactly that salary expectation. So what is your take on trying to retain that talent, like from getting poached by other companies or, or some of these other ones, they're just going to throw money? Yeah. Well, look, I, I mean, I know this is the saying, but like money is not everything, at least for me and for some people, money is not everything. And for some people, money is everything. And that's 100% okay. And those people should absolutely go work at a company that's going to throw money at them. You know, like there are a million times in your life when you need money, maybe you're about to have a kid or you're saving for a house or you're supporting a family member or whatever. Like, absolutely. There is nothing wrong with going and working for so one you're of those not companies. Offended. And if I came to you and said, hey, Sam, I got to leave because Google is giving me this much money. You're not going to be pissed or something. No, I mean, the, like, first, it's a conversation, right? If someone says to me, hey, I have an offer to go somewhere else. There's a lot of things I want to know. First off is like, congratulations, you know, good for you. Like getting an offer at any company is huge. It takes a lot of hard work. Good for you. Second, yeah. like, I'd love to know why the person was looking. You know, what what is it about here that they're not totally happy with? And that's not in necessarily an effort to like save or rescue them, but that's in a like, hey, what are we, what are we doing wrong? You know, and, and I want to hear that because... I want to think about that for the rest of the team. If you're unhappy with something, maybe somebody else is unhappy with that same thing, you know? And so, or maybe it's not that you're unhappy. Maybe it's just that there's something else or something different, you know, in, in this other thing. And so I want to understand, you know, what's up? Is it, is it about money? Is it that you're, you don't feel like you're growing as a person here? Is it that you no longer believe in the company or the leadership? Or is it that you don't like the mission or you know, what, what is that thing? And, and so let's talk about it. And if there's a way to resolve that, absolutely, you know, let's resolve it. And if there's a oh. way, or if there isn't a way to resolve that, you know, if it's the like, Hey, they're just going to pay me 20,000 more a year. And, and I really, you know, want that money right now. Like, okay, great. Good for you. You know, and, and how can I help? You know, what do you need between now and then? And how do we stay in touch? Like it's, it's really my intention with my team and my team members to make this a really great stop in their career. But number one, I don't expect that it is the end all be all in their career. And two, my hope is that, you know, we, we stay in touch and we, we stay friends. The design community is very small. The design community in the Bay Area is even smaller, but I actually, before you and I started recording, um, I had been up in San Francisco having lunch with one of my best friends who I met at my first job out here. Like my first week of my first job, I met her. That was 12 and a half years ago, 12 years ago. Um, and she's still one of my best friends. She was at my wedding a few months ago. I was at her wedding a few years ago. Wow. I say a few years generously. She now has two kids who are like 10 and eight. It's absolutely crazy at this point. But those are the kinds of relationships that I want to have with people. And so it's not about like, you should work for me or you should work for Chime or you shouldn't work for me. It's the like, what do you need right now for your life, for your career? What's right for you or for your family? How do I help you get that? Because that's really what's important at the end of the day. So you believe that counter offers work? Because you know how like the industry has their own take on it. Like you've got someone that's gotten a job from Google that's coming to you and telling you about it. And you feel like you can remedy that situation. 
So do you still believe that that counter offer for them to stay at your current company will work? Or do, are you of the perspective that, <laughs> you know, at this point, it's like, it's not a good idea, probably? There's not, there isn't a yes or no answer to that. Okay. Um, the hot take is that I probably think most of the time counter offers don't work and they're not worth it. I think, look, like, I, I think if there's something that can legitimately be fixed, great. You know, and sometimes that is the case. And honestly, my hope is that any team that I'm leading, I hope we have a good enough culture and one of auth authenticity, one of transparency and honesty, and one of really believing in each other and wanting the best for each other, where if someone is unhappy, I really hope we find out before they have another offer in hand. I really, really hope so. Wow. And I think for the most part, once somebody has another offer in hand, honestly, I think most of the time they've made up their minds already. I and see. I think the counter offer is fine. And, you know, if it's somebody that you really care about and want them to stick around and, you know, let's say it's just a like, hey, I really want to stick around. I love this company. I love our mission. I love what we're working on, but I'm getting this amount of money somewhere else and I really want to buy a house. And so like, you know, can you match that? You know, maybe, sure. You know, and, and you probably want to do what's right for that person. And, you know, I don't know, that's not a conversation I want to have over an offer. That's a conversation I want one of my people to come to me and say, hey, Sam, heads up. You know, my family and I are looking to buy a house in the next few months. Is there anything you can do with my salary? Because I'm feeling a little bit stretched. Like, absolutely. You know, then, then oh I want to have God. that conversation. But I do think a lot of times when someone has another offer in hand, they've made their decision. And at that point, you're either succumbing to you know the bait of a of an offer war yeah. but i'm not going to say that's all the time i will just say that, that that's my hot take on it no i love that because literally like so that my counter perspective to this thing is like if i'm the candidate and then you know i get this offer and i get a counter offer from the company i'm working at you know my perspective as a candidate is like well why did that offer not come like why did this raise not come without me having to present an offer so yeah Instead, what you're saying is that instead of us doing all this shenanigans and dance, I should just come directly to you and be like, all right, Sam, so X, Y, Z reason, but I'm here and I want to get here. Is there something we can do? So that will save me the trouble and you the trouble and we can have an honest conversation. Totally. And wouldn't you rather work somewhere and like for a person where you can have those honest conversations, yes. you know, and, and I, w I was coming at that, you know, obviously from the, from the hiring manager standpoint, from the candidate standpoint, I totally agree with you, right? Like I shouldn't have to go interview and get an offer somewhere else for you to promote me. I shouldn't have to show you that somebody else values me for you to value me. Like I, with any manager I have, I want to be able to sit down with them and say, here's what I think my value is. Here's what I think my worth is. Do you believe that that's my value and that's my worth? And if you don't, I want to know why. And let's talk about it. And if you do, then you should be paying me, you know, or titling me or whatever it is at that worth. And, and I think that that lets you have a really honest conversation. Maybe I think I'm worth way more than, you know, my manager does. And they can tell me, like, actually, here's why. I'm not ready to promote you is because I don't see you doing enough of X, Y, and Z. And then, you know, and then you're like, oh, okay. I didn't even realize that. Like, okay, I'm going to go work on those things now. Um, and so I, I do really think having those development conversations, not even development conversations, but being able to have really candid conversations with your employees or with your manager about, you know, here's where I think I'm at. Here are the things I want next, whether those are professional, whether they're personal, you know, I, um, you know, I've had employees come to me and say like, hey, I just want you to know my partner and I are thinking about having kids in the next year. And it's like, oh, okay, great. That's super helpful to know that that's the stage in life where you're at. And that then helps me think through, okay, what kinds of growth opportunities do they want? How much workload can they take on right now? Or do we need to tone some of that back, you know, or, or I'm moving or this, that, or the other thing, or the like, I'm really gung ho right now. Like, give me all the things to work on, you know, great. Um, but I, I think those conversations are just so important and so important to be candid. And I think especially as, as a woman, um, I think it's sometimes scary to be candid in these conversations. Really, if you're, if you're any underrepresented party, I think you often feel um, like you can't show any kind of vulnerability, right? Like you can't be candid. You can't talk about things. And I think that's really important. I've met so many people who, you know, leave a job 
thinking like they're not paying me enough or I don't get enough vacation days or whatever it is, but they actually never go ask for those things. And they're afraid to ask because they think that if they ask, they'll get told no, or they think they'll get fired or whatever it is. But instead, then they go find a job somewhere else. And it's like, but you were happy there. Maybe you were learning and you were growing. You know, why, why not ask for those things? Um, so I do think it's really, really important. I told my brother to renegotiate his offer. And uh, he's like, oh, no, I can't do that. I'm like, why? And this answer like just made me laugh. He's like, oh, if I, if I ask for more, they'll take back the offer. I'm like, what? What do you mean take back the offer? <laughs> So I've had offers rescinded on me before. <laughs> I literally have like gone to negotiate offers and they've rescinded the offer and said like, if you're negotiating with us, you're clearly not bought into our mission and we don't, no longer want you to come work for us. And you know what? Great. Great. Oh my God. Because if I can't have a candid conversation with you and say, here's how much I think here's how much I value myself. And I think you should value me at that amount too. And you're, and if they're not going to, entertain that conversation, I'd way rather find that out now than sign that offer and then get into a culture like that. You know, for me personally, that's, that's not a culture I want. Um, so it is actually, it's kind of a fun test, right? Yeah. Negotiating an offer because it tells you a lot about a company before you go to work there. Um, but I think it's, it's very scary to hear the word. No, it's also, I think, scarier to anticipate hearing the word. No. Um, and I've I've done like all of the leadership books and all the leadership training and, and a lot of the, you know, learning how to be a female leader in a male dominated industry. Um, and the word no, you know, tends to be one of these things that as humans, we're very scared of. We're scared to tell people. We're scared to hear ourselves. And one of the pieces of advice I heard at one point was just like, get used to hearing no. Like, go put yourself in situations where you're going to hear the word no so that you stop being afraid of it. Um, and so I've started doing things like anytime I fly. I'll walk up to the ticket desk before I get on the plane. I'll be like, hey, can you upgrade me? Oh, my like, no. God. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. You know, or if I'm at a restaurant, I'll be like, hey, you want to give me an extra glass of wine for free? And <laughs> what is surprising, I think, more than anything is how many times someone's like, oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Like, first class isn't full. We'll upgrade you. I mean, it happens rarely in the airplane scenario, hotels, same thing. But a lot of times I can get the free glass of wine <laughs> at a restaurant or bar. It helps if I, you know, kind of bat my <laughs> eyelashes a little bit. But but it, it's really interesting, right? This idea of like getting comfortable and the idea that there's nothing attached to it. Like if I ask for an upgrade and I don't get it, the world goes on, True. you know? And so like this idea that like your self-worth is not tied to these negotiations that like you can value yourself and... And you can hear the word no, and you can figure out, is that thing important to you or not, you know, and kind of, kind of go on with your life. So anyway, a little bit of a tangent, but, um, it's oh, I love that one. because it's a perfect segue to my next uh, thing. I was just thinking about, as you said, this as a female design leader, as a woman design leader, what are some of the unique challenges you had to face? Um, that maybe, you know, if, if you were a male in a parallel universe, you wouldn't have had to face. <laughs> Oh, I could talk about this for hours and hours. How long did you say we were going to record? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, there's so much. I mean, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I can talk about like my own, you know, personal yeah. challenges that I faced. Um, a big one, honestly, just being like I'm I'm from New York, I'm very type A. I am a very candid, straightforward person, if that hasn't come across already. Um, that can be very threatening to people in a lot of environments. You know, I think there's definitely this expectation, even still today, you know, that women are quiet and accommodating and nurturing. And I am not a lot of those things. <laughs> um, certainly not quiet, uh, occasionally accommodating, nurturing for the right people when I want to be. Um, but you know, that, that is the expectation. And when I show up with a strong opinion and I'm not afraid to really, you know, sit at a table and like lean in and say something, um, have definitely had that be intimidating to people. Um, and I've had, I've been told before, you know, that the reason I wasn't getting promoted was because not enough people liked me, you know, and it oh was, it's always couched in something, you know, so it doesn't sound ever that, uh, blatant of a, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not like that blatantly biased, you know, but it's yes. usually the like, well, we want to make sure that if we announce this promotion, that everybody would be genuinely excited about it, which is kind of the same thing as, yeah. well, you're not winning the popularity contest right now. 
you know, so, so that's, that's been a big one. A big thing that I've been taking on recently is deciding like what matters to me and deciding what I want to own and what I'm going to let other people own. And so I have learned over the course of my career that when I get very excited about something, I can act very intense and my tone of voice can get very intense. And so there are a few things I've learned about this. One is that it happens. Um, Two is I've learned to catch it in the moment. And then I've learned how I want to handle it. And so if it's something that I'm actually not that mad about, sometimes it sounds mad. Like oftentimes it sounds mad when I'm not mad is really what this comes down to, right? And so if it's not something I'm mad about, I've learned to like kind of catch myself and say like, I think I'm sounding like I'm really mad right now. I'm totally not mad. I just feel really strongly about this. That's something that I can own, right? And so I'm not going to pull my punches. I'm not going to soften my words and not say the things I'm saying, but I will try to soften my tone and externally communicate that I'm aware, right? And that that I'm self-aware, I know what's going on. But the other piece of that are the things I'm not going to own, which is if you're intimidated by me, that does not make me intimidating. That makes you intimidated. And that is an emotion for you to own. That's not necessarily something for me to fix about myself. And so I'm going to own my intensity. Like that is how my passion comes through. And passion is important. And people who like the passion, the intensity are going to want to work with me and hang out with me and people who aren't are not. And that's okay. You know, I don't, I don't have to be for everybody. Um, so that's, that's been really important. And I think it is very easy as a woman, especially we are like very often taught to be nurturing and accommodating, taught to take care of others. And so we don't always take care of ourselves. We don't always think about what do I need right now? You know, we think about like, how do I change myself so everybody else can like me? How do I be nicer here, but a little bit stronger here? And how do I, you know, give you my chair at the table instead of taking my seat where I deserve a seat at the table? Um, And so there's a lot, a lot to unpack there. But I think maybe the most important thing that I have learned as a woman in any industry, um, but especially in a male dominated one, is to turn around and pull other people with you. Um, I think way too often there's unfair, like pressured competition between women. Like it feels like if there's a table of 10 people, only one woman gets to sit at the table. And so all the women are competing for that one seat instead of one woman sitting at the table and then offering the chair next to them to another woman. Right. And I think that's so, so important. And so there's a lot of fighting to get the seat at the table. But once you're there, you have to be inviting others. You have to be turning around and helping other people get there too. You know, it's the only way that we're going to change things. Oh my God. This is a lot of things are coming to my mind as I was just processing everything you were saying. Like, it's just like, it just made me aware of so many things that probably I don't have to think about. Um, and I was like, wow, I never, never thought about it from that perspective. Oh my God. I was I was having a conversation with someone at work the other day and we were talking about this because we were talking about going back to the office and how it's like very weird, you know, being at an office after all this time and seeing different people's energy in the room and how that's different than their energy on Zoom. And we were talking about how in some ways Zoom is really great for gender bias specifically and in, in other ways it's not, but that there's this idea of like physical space. And I don't know if you've ever noticed this. And obviously this is generalization, but typically you walk into a conference room, let's say there's a table and there are chairs around the table and then there are kind of chairs around the perimeter. You know, for the most part, men are going to walk in, take a seat at the table. For the most part, women tend to sit around the perimeter, you know, kind of thinking, oh, let somebody else have a seat, you know, before I take a seat. But then, you know, you end up, again, generalized, but with a table with men sitting around it, women tend to be around the perimeter. And then as you're getting into conversation, again, generalized, men tend to interrupt and talk over and women tend to, you know, kind of raise their hand or wait. And if you're on the perimeter, people can't see you necessarily raising your hand. They don't see you like trying to get into the conversation and the people at the table are speaking over each other and the decision is getting made there. And so Zoom is very interesting in that 
everybody is kind of equally at the table when you're looking at a screen. And in terms of physical space, women tend to also in a room like cross their legs and kind of arms here and like take up as little space as possible. Again, in this like nurturing, accommodating way of like, there's so many people around me, I don't want to take up space. Men kind of come in, you know, like <laughs> legs are spread doing their thing and like taking up more physical space. And again, you can't do that on Zoom, right? Like everybody gets the same size box. Um, so it's it's just very interesting to think about like all these behaviors and characteristics that you become aware of. And that as a woman, I'm constantly like when I walk into a room, it's not as easy as just like walking in saying, hi, how are you? And sitting down, I'm constantly thinking like, OK, I want to sit at the table. So I'm going to go and sit at the table so that I can have my seat. But then I also look around the room and I look for my team members and I'm like, actually, I'm a head of design. I don't need the glory. I want to give my seat to one of my team members to elevate them. And so all of this is go. And then I'm thinking like, how do I not sit with my legs crossed and like trying to be as teeny as possible? But how do I really like take up more physical? And these are the things that go through my head when I walk into a conference room and sit down and the meeting hasn't even started yet. Right. Oh like, my God. It's absolutely, it, you know, <laughs> these, these are all the things one has to think about. Yeah. Um, so I'll stop. I'm, I'm going off on. <laughs> No, it's like there, so. <laughs> there's like a SAM microprocessor that's already running even before the meeting started figuring out all the algorithm and all these things happening. I was like, oh my God, like the amount of like um, planning and stuff and oh my God. And and I was going to say, and there are a million ways in which I have been very lucky and very blessed and very fortunate. You know, I'm a white woman in America. Life is probably not that hard for me. Um, but you know, it's, it's, there's a lot, a lot to think about if you're in any kind of underrepresented class beyond just the day to day of the work. And, and then people wonder why we're all exhausted at the end of the day. You know, it's like, I haven't looked at Figma in six months, but I'm exhausted at the end of every day. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, speak to me a little bit about that. Like um, you said, you haven't like, let's say as a head of design, haven't looked at Figma in a little bit. See, as an individual contributor for me, a lot of that confidence comes from the fact that I know how to use my tools. I know how to do this. And that's how like I battle my imposter syndrome. So do heads of design actually have imposter syndrome? Is that even a thing that's even valid for them? Yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, I can only speak for myself and I, I wouldn't call it imposter syndrome, at least not for me. Um, but there are definitely, I mean, it's funny. I, I do use Figma. I'm in Figma probably every day, but very rarely to do design work. Like I draw org charts in Figma. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. I prefer that to doing it, you know, somewhere else. Or I was working with our recruiting team the other day, putting together a really cool file and book that we could send to candidates. Right. So I, I designed that. Um, <laughs> again, goes back to hiring. Um, you know, but I was doing something and I was like trying to change the color or something and I like could not get it to work. And it's like, this is ridiculous. Like I'm out of design. I don't even know how auto layouts work in Figma. <laughs> like you throw a file at me these days and I am lost. Um, and in some ways that feels, in some ways that builds a little bit of insecurity, right? You know, it's like, hey, I'm yeah. a head of design. I should be the best designer on the team. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm not the best designer on the team. What am I doing? And then a lot of times I'm like, no, I should not be the best designer on the team. <laughs> like if your head of design is sitting in Figma doing design work, they're doing the wrong thing. That's not what the company needs from them. There are very talented ICs probably like yourself out there who are on top of market trends, who are in Figma every day, who can and should be doing great design work. That is not what Chime or any company needs from a head of design. What Chime needs from me right now is to grow our team to keep up with all of the amazing things that we're going to do for our members next year. I mean, I've hired, I think I've hired 20 people this year, 21 people this year, hopefully with another, you know, six or seven before the year is out. That's what Chime needs from me. And so I don't need to be in Figma. I don't need to be good at design. It kind of goes back to how we started this conversation. I want to hire people who are really good at design, who are on top of the trends, who can do that. But like, that's not the role I'm supposed to play anymore. And so, you know, I, Chime needs me to grow the team. Chime needs me to make sure that the work the team is putting out is really good. You know, so it's my job to give the team things like principles of, okay, hey, here's how we should operate as a team. And here's what every experience should feel like. You know, and, and have you done these things? Have you gotten it in front of your partners early and often? And 
is it scalable? You know, does it work today? And when we add these 10 other things later, um, that's, that's what chime needs for me. But I don't, I don't really feel bad about, you know, not designing stuff in Figma every day. It's just, that's, that's not the highest impact thing that I can be doing with my time right now. But then how do you keep the pulse of the culture? Like, like the things you should be focusing on, because somebody could be not performing. Somebody could be rude to me because I am lower in the totem pole, but they could be very nice. You know, um, they could like, you know, say all the sweet stuff to you and everybody is going to pay, paint a very rosy picture to you. So how do you figure out like, Oh my God, there's some really this issue going on on the team and nobody's telling me the real stuff. Yeah. So this changes all the time. Um, because as the team gets bigger and has different types of people on it, we just need different things. Um, when the team was small, I used to have a weekly one-on-one -on -one with every single person on the team. And then as we got bigger, they became bi-weekly. And then for a while I was doing monthly one-on-ones with every single person on the team. And now my team is like 35 people. <laughs> I just, oh I can't do it. Um, I really want to, I can't. Um, but that was a great way to kind of just check in with every person, you know, regularly and see like, Hey, what's going on? And, tell me what you want the next step in your career to be and what kinds of opportunities should we be putting in front of you and how's your dog and how's your, you know, your spouse or, or whatever. Um, you know, now I've gotten to a place where I kind of do like a, an office hours and, and I hope folks come in and hang out with me. I get sad when they don't, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's a lot. And again, this is like over zoom, right? Like if we were in person, it'd be the happy hours and the coffees and the, you know, having lunch together and stuff like that. I find that's really hard to, to keep up over zoom. Like when I'm on my lunch break, I actually want to walk away from my computer for 30 minutes and like refresh my eyeballs, you know? And when I'm done with the day, I really don't want to be drinking beers over zoom. I want to be sitting at a bar, <laughs> drinking a beer, talking to somebody, not their computer screen. Um, you know, but, but I do find ways to do that. And so it's, a, it's a lot of just like checking in with people, but it's also a lot of trusting the leaders I've hired beneath me, you know, and, and checking in with them. Like, Hey, how's your team? How are your employees? What's going on? What are you hearing? Um, what should we be doing better? What should I specifically? Because there's a difference between like what should we as a team do better and what can I, Sandberg, head of design, do better, right? Um, so I mean, obviously nothing's perfect, um, but but I, I do try really hard to have one-on-one -on -one relationships with everybody on the team to make myself very visible and as approachable as I can be while knowing that sometimes I intimidate people um, and really letting people know, you know, that, that I have an open door and that I want us to have the candid conversations. Um, I've told my team, I've told every team who I've ever worked with, every person who's ever worked for me that I will not lie to them, that they can ask me anything at any point in time. I will always open answer openly and honestly. And if there's something I can't tell them, I will be very clear about what I can't tell them. Like, Hey, Am I do you know fired, why Sam? so and so? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> hey, you know, do you know why so and so left this team? I do. I can't talk about the details. You know, is a way to say like, hey, I know something, but I can't tell you. You know, or it's, I don't know. Reading between the lines, here's kind of what I saw. You know, and and how are you thinking about it? Um, and and that's just one example. But like, I I want the team to know that I'm really here for them. Like, period, end of story. You know, and it, it goes back to the like, someone wants to leave, great. Like, if that's what they need to be successful, like, I want to see people be successful. Like, like chime earmuffs on on the company. You know, I don't want them to hear me say this, but like, you know, I I love chime. It's a great company. Obviously, I want to keep great employees there for as long as possible. But at the end of the day, it's so much more important to me that somebody is happy and getting something, you know, getting what they want out of their career. And if that can't happen at Chime, I want to help them find that next thing. I want to help them find what that is. Um, so I feel like we kind of went full circle there. But <laughs> I know. And, and I'm just thinking like that you're the head of design and a lot of responsibilities are on your shoulder. And now you've got a family too. You've got your family life. You've got your friends and all these things. So it could be very easy to just like destroy the boundaries between your personal, like Sam's time or Sam is with the family and friends and Sam is, you know, at Chime um, or any other company she works at. So how do you like maintain a healthy work-life balance or, there, or, or there's just no thing as work-life balance. Like if you're head of design, then yeah, <laughs> the weekends you got to be hustling and grinding too. And then if you do that, the employees think that, oh, this is what we got to do to survive in this kind of culture. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, I very firmly believe in work-life balance. I very firmly believe in vacation. I very firmly believe in nights and weekends. Um, so I'll start with me um, and what I do for myself. Um, I, because I'm very type A, my brain is always spinning, <laughs> like always hustling somewhere. Um, and I need a break from that. And I found for me that the only time my brain stops moving is if my body is physically moving. So I work out almost every day. It's not because I necessarily love it. It's not because I think it's going to keep me skinny. I eat way too much for that. Um, but it is literally to like give myself a mental break every day. Um, and I really like to work out over lunch in particular. For me personally, it is the most gratifying time to work out um, because I get a break from the day. And so whatever problems I was ruminating on from the morning, I put out of my mind for a little bit, whatever I'm nervous about in the evening, you know, or the afternoon, I can like get the stress out. Um, and so working out over lunch is my thing. And so that's just what I do. My calendar is blocked off every day for an hour. If I don't work out for whatever reason, I go for a walk. You know, when we were in the office, there was a yoga studio that was kind of down the street. I would go there over lunch and people just knew like I was not in the office, you know, from 12 to one, I went to yoga. I always came back with wet hair after showering and people are like, oh, how was your workout? Um, but that was really, it still is like, that's really, really important to me. Early mornings and nights are like my time. I'm grumpy in the morning. So you don't want me in the office or on Zoom <laughs> anyway in the morning when I first wake up. But like I have, you know, my time to have my coffee and get my head working right. Um, and and really for the most part in the evenings, like after six o'clock, like I'm shutting it down. It's dinner time. I'm spending time with my husband or I'm spending time with friends. And it it really to me makes me think of the you know, the classic airlines, like put your, put your mask on first before helping sure. your child. Like you need to be your best self to help other people be their best self. And if I am tired or stressed out or burning out, I can't help other people be better. And so I really need to take care of myself. So that's, that's kind of where I start. That's the, the like Sam boundaries. Um, and those are just my boundaries, right? Like I know other people who are super productive from six to 9 PM, but then they're going to sleep until noon, you know? And so if that's the boundary you want to set, you know, great. So that's kind of me. And then, and then I also think a lot now as a head of design, I think a lot about what my actions signal to other people, which you don't have to do early in your career. You kind of just do your thing and you don't think too much about yeah. it. And now it's like everything I do, I'm thinking about like, how are other people going to read it? And what does it say to them? Um, and so I... I'm pretty public about the fact that I work out over lunch and I'm not ashamed to show up with my wet hair for all my one o'clock meetings because I want it to signal to my team and to other people, you should absolutely take time for yourself. There's nothing worse than walking out of the office at five o'clock and especially this time of year, it's dark outside and you're like, I have no idea what the weather was like today. I never left, right? Like that's not the kind of balance I want my team members to have. I want to encourage them, you know, go out for lunch, go take a walk, go work out, do whatever you need to do. Um, I always take a big vacation over New Year's. Last year, I was gone for two whole weeks. Uh, this year, I'll be gone for three weeks, but it's not quite over New Year's. It's a little bit earlier and it's our honeymoon. So it's a little different, wow. but I'm also like very vocal, you know, with the team of like last year, I was like, I'm going away for two weeks. You will not see me on email. You will not see me on Slack see you in two weeks, I'm out, <laughs> you know? And like, and I want them to see that from me because I want them to take two weeks of vacation every year. I came back, oh my gosh, I came back in brand new person, right? I was re-energized. I was excited about what we were working on. I was missing my team. I hadn't seen them in two weeks. You know, I was like excited to start 2021. Like I want people like that all the time. And so if that means long weekends, if that means, you know, taking vacation, like please go do it, you know? And, and the, the thing I'm really, really loving these days is that in both email and Slack, you can schedule send. So it used to be like Slack somebody at, you know, for me, it would be like six o'clock on a Saturday and I'd be, please don't read this till Monday. But I was yeah. out to dinner with a friend and I was thinking about this and it made me remember that I need to talk to you about this. And so I'm leaving this here so that we can talk about it before I forget, you know, but like, don't read it right now. But then people see it and they read it and, you know, whatever. And now I'm like, oh, great. I can go put that in Slack and schedule send it for Monday morning. <laughs> you know, and so like I'm I try very, very hard not to send Slacks anytime like before 10 a.m., anytime after 5 p.m., anytime. It doesn't mean I always do it well, but I try really hard to like schedule that stuff and send it later because I also don't know what boundaries other people have. Like just because I don't 
want to, or just because maybe I am working, you know, at five o'clock on a Monday, again, like my colleague on the East coast probably is not working at five o'clock. And so if I schedule send, like it's safe, you know, they'll see it in the morning. Um, email being the same thing, like getting those weekend emails is the worst. And so now it's like, oh, send first thing Monday morning or like, you know, send tomorrow. And it's from you. So uh, people are probably going to reply <laughs> even if they don't want to. Exactly. Yeah. And I, it, I know when it's me, like if I get a thing from my boss or from our CEO, I'm like, oh my God, you know, like instantly I'm like, am I in trouble? And then my second thought is like, okay, what is, what is it they need? And how do I go do it right now and make sure they're not waiting? I don't want people feeling that for me. Like, I don't want them feeling like they're in trouble. I don't want them feeling like they have to respond to stuff. Cause like, I think you have to work smarter and not harder. So I want people to work fewer hours, but I want them to be smarter when they do work. Like, what are the things that are highest impact? Where should they put their time today? How are we going to get the most out of them and do that in those fewer hours? And so, like, I don't want my team to think that they have to work, you know, 13, 14, 15 hour days just to be successful. I would way rather see someone getting all that work done in like three hours. I'd pat them on the back and be like, great, go have the rest of your day. You know, if you're that productive, like amazing. Um, And teach us, teach the rest of us how to do that too. (laughs) That's awesome. Oh my God. How can people find you or get in touch with you? Um, (laughs) I mean, all the usual suspects. Uh, There's always LinkedIn. My, I have a personal website, samanthaeberg.com. You can check that out. Um, I've got some things up there, some of the talks I've given, some articles I've written. Um, if you want to go hear a little bit more from me. Um, but otherwise, you know, I think LinkedIn is probably the best way to get in touch. Got it. Um, thank you so much, Samantha, for coming on the show. It's been a blast. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. This has been an absolute pleasure.